I think it's on. All right. Morning, everybody. How are we doing? Great. I'd like to say hi to, uh, the, you know, there are 41 different families streaming today. 41. Um, I saw a handful of people uh, say hi in the chat. The, the McCullas in Texas, Stephen and Cookie, the Hartles, uh, a few others. So welcome to, to you uh, streaming as well. Um, praise God. How exciting it is to get to be here this morning. A um, little bit about me. My name is Dustin White today. Um, you know, mo most people know me as Dusty. I think I say that basically at the beginning of any time that I get to speak because Dusty, Dustin, what I, okay, we're not going to go down that road again. Um, I've been attending Rock Valley for about 15 years. Um, David's a mentor of mine a long time, and uh, my wife and I got married and we started a family here. So um, today I get to bring the word, and I am excited to take us to the book of Luke. So um, we're going to go to the book of Luke, and we're going to pick it up in chapter 16. I'd also like to say welcome if this is uh, your first time or amongst your first times, welcome. Um, we, as a, as a church, love to stay and hang out for hours afterwards. I don't know how much of that we're going to do today because it's supposed to be like, 100 degrees or something like that, kind of hot. It's nothing compared to Phoenix. My, my brother Tim's here from Phoenix, and he said it's like 115 there. So I, I'm grateful for my 100-degree weather today. Um, so we're going to pick it up in uh, uh, chapter 16. We're, we're going to look at chapter 16, verse 19. Um, th this is a, a parable that, that Jesus tells. It's called the parable of the, the rich man and Lazarus. Um, and we're going to read this whole thing. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Pause right there. Fared sumptuously basically just means that he ate, he ate like a king. He feasted every single day. Um, we don't usually use those words, fared sumptuously. Maybe we should. But, uh, there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. More, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was the beggar died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to them, or he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. So we're going to unpack this a little bit today. Um, there, there's a, a bit of speculation about the, this passage. If you were to do a quick Google search and see what the, the internet and different Christian perspectives are on this passage. Um, what, I, what I can tell you, I, I don't believe that this is a fully comprehensive expository on life after death. I'm just going to put that out there right now. And the reason I don't believe that is because God makes it pretty clear in several other scriptures. And we're not going to go down, down the path of, of what, what life after death looks like and the, the resurrection and such. There's actually a number of messages online that, that uh, Pastor David has given. I think one of them is literally called What Happens When You Die. Um, and then there was one uh, ah, maybe about five, six, seven years ago. There, there's a whole library online, rbcc.co. You can go and find them there. Um, but it, in short, God, God makes it pretty clear that 
um, when, when you die, um, you, you're laid to rest. It, it says in Acts chapter 2 uh, that um, when Paul was talking to, to the people, or not Paul, when Peter was talking to the people, he said, David, I, I assure you, is with us today in the grave. He has not ascended. Jesus has ascended. It says in the Old Testament, several different places, it talks about how basically when, you, when you're dead, you don't have consciousness. Um, so once again, I don't believe this is an expository of life after death. Um, and I don't believe that that is the intention of this uh, parable, for lack of better words. Um, one, one thing that I want to show you, if we rewind just a little bit, um, verse 14. And actually, so Jesus did a parable. Uh, it's called the parable of the unjust steward. basically talks about making friends with unrighteous mammon, uh, what, what you are faithful with and what you are not faithful with and how that uh, relates to you. And then actually in verse 13, he says, no servant can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon and mammon is money. Now the Pharisees who were lovers of money also heard all these things and they derided him. And Jesus said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men. God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed amongst men is an abomination in the sight of God. So God is, uh, and Jesus is, is uh, I, I think, pretty clearly uh, speaking to, to the Pharisees here. Um, he says that God knows your hearts. And then even, even in the beginning, I don't think it's a coincidence that he said that this rich man was clothed in purple and fine linen, which is uh, uh, basically the, the garb that, that God prescribed in the Old Testament at least in part, purple and fine linen is, is what the, the, the priests would wear. Um, so I, I'm going to go down this path and say that this was likely a warning to the Pharisees of, of some, some kind. Um, and that, that warning actually is, is fairly clear. You, you can see here, and we're going to uh, read verses 30 and 31 again. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes from the dead, they will, be, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one raised from the dead. What Jesus is basically saying is, what is the condition of your heart, Pharisees? And you, you can see in this specific example the, the law in Moses basically has it all. It, it is the, the word of God. And there, there is plenty there in that text to be able to point you to repentance. But the veil hadn't been lifted. And, and in that, their hearts were set. And then in that, basically, Jesus goes so far as to say, even if someone were to be raised from the dead, they, they, they wouldn't repent. And um, I find this actually kind of interesting. Of, of all the parables that Jesus uh, gives and all the stories that he touches on, this is the only example in the entire Bible that he uses a proper noun. And he calls, he calls the person in the parable by name, Lazarus. Huh. Now, I don't know if it, it, it could be coincidence. It could not be. Um, we're going to go to John chapter 11. So chronologically, I don't, I don't know where, where this falls into place. I don't know if it, it could just be a coincidence. I, I'm obviously not exactly this, the same exact person, but isn't it kind of funny that, that there just so happens to be a Lazarus that was raised from the dead. And what was their response to Lazarus being raised from the dead? We can actually look. So uh, we'll, we'll start in verse 43 of John chapter 11. Now, when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things that Jesus did believed in him. Which is a really beautiful response to somebody being raised from the dead and seeing Jesus do a miracle, right? Um, as it turns out, a lot of the miracles, there are seven miracles in John. That, that's really why, why Jesus performed these miracles, to cause others to believe. But in verse 46, 
But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them these things that Jesus did. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered counsel and said, what shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. Lord forbid. (laughs) And the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. We're going to skip down to verse 53. Then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. Isn't that incredible? I mean, I, I don't know about you guys, but I mean, you see somebody working signs and miracles and even to the point of raising somebody from the dead after being dead for four days. How stubborn does your heart have to be that your response to that is not only to not believe, but to want to kill the person who did it? And how funny it is that Jesus even basically spoke to them the condition of their hearts and saying, even if someone were raised from the dead, they wouldn't repent. Um, and then another just, it, it, it's a, a quasi, it's actually, I, it might, might even be worth reading this. It, if you go just to the next chapter over, John chapter 12, uh, I think it's in verse 9. Yeah. Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they may also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to kill Lazarus to death, or put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews went away believing in Jesus. So not only did they want to kill Jesus, but they wanted to kill Lazarus again, which is really mean in my opinion. Um, It's like, dude, (laughs) he's already died once. You put him through that again, that's not not cool, man. Um, but yeah, that's, that was the condition of their heart. And then Matthew chapter 28, um, this is a very tail end of Matthew. Um, Jesus died, he's resurrected. Basically, there were guards at the tomb and then the stone was rolled away. And Jesus comes out and does all of his awesome Jesus things after he's uh, raised from the dead. Um, verse 11, chapter 28, verse 11. Now, while they were going, Behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. So the guards went and told the chief priests, hey, we saw Jesus. He's alive. Sorry. Um, When they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers saying, tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. So there, there's another, maybe not as extreme example of them trying to kill somebody, but basically a, another report of somebody being raised from the dead. And I say to you, unless, you, unless somebody, or not even if somebody were raised from the dead, would they believe, would they repent? But instead, in this instance, they basically pay them off and said, hey, just tell them that their disciples took him away. So it it seems pretty clear to me that God already knew the heart that the Pharisees had and the response that they would have. He showed them the response that they would have. And then this was verified a couple of different times. The response that they had to somebody being raised from the dead by the glory of the Father And not only did they not believe, but they went in the completely opposite direction. They they doubled down on their unbelief. And I think, at least in part, the lesson here today for us is what, what is it that is in your heart? And how strongly does what is in your heart and what you believe influence your actions influence what you do, further perpetuate and influence what you believe. I, I think uh, many of us can at least relate to this in part because, well, we're here on, on the Sabbath, right? It's, it, it is not, a, at least in the Christian church, a common day to meet. There's, you know, it's widely perpetuated that, um, Either the Sabbath is done away with, or the Sabbath is whatever day you want it to be, um, or the Sabbath is uh, a, 
uh, was put put to death when Jesus died on the cross and raised from the dead. Any one of those things. And we, we are all here collectively today on the seventh day of the week, on the Sabbath, because we believe that, well, the, the Sabbath day is still alive and well and valid. There's a reason that Jesus, or there's a reason that God put it in the Ten Commandments. And ironically, if you go throughout the entire Bible and look at the Sabbath, God's heart on the Sabbath is one that really loves it in every single facet. It's no reason why, why you wouldn't want to celebrate the Sabbath, right? Now, how many of us passively get into conversation with a, a friend or maybe a loved one, a family member, and you get to talking about the Sabbath? And you already, I, I, I don't know about you, but I, I've experienced this where like you, somebody knows that I keep the Sabbath and they've, they've like already made up their mind the Sabbath is done away with. And then we get to talking. And it's like, it's like I'm talking to a, a preset script of something that they've already established and believed in their hearts and saying, the Sabbath is done away with. Jesus is our rest. I remember even 15 years ago, I was talking to, to uh, a, a family member and, and he said, Dust, Jesus, Jesus is our rest. You don't need to keep the Sabbath in, in, on, on the seventh day. And it was like, man, what, what's the point? <laughs> What, what's the point in even trying to talk to you when you've already established in your heart that the Sabbath is, is done away with? And uh, I, I'm sure we could probably all relate. And the Sabbath is just one example. It's a tangible example because we happen to be here on Sabbath. But there's any number of things that, that, that we believe and hold to be true and know to be true. And you get to talking with other people and they believe their things and are convinced in their heart that what they believe is true, and the condition that God is showing us in this Luke chapter 16 is what is in your heart and what you've already predetermined and set to be true and believe in your heart, in the Pharisees' case, that Jesus was not the Messiah, that they would find life. And Jesus said that you search the scriptures because in them you think that you have life. They thought that they have life following the law, following Moses and the prophets, and were completely missing the mark. Um, it says in Proverbs chapter 2, Proverbs chapter 2, and we're going to start in the beginning, Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1. There we go. My son, if you receive my words... And treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom, and apply your heart and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. I'm going to ask a redundant question. Where does wisdom come from? From where does knowledge and understanding come from? From Yahweh. The only reason that we have the ability to believe what God says to be true is because God showed us. See, he's the one who wrote the truth, who created the truth, who gave us the truth in, in his word, but then testifies to us that truth by his spirit, and then even gives us the grace to be able to believe the things that he says are true. It says in, uh, we're, we're gonna go to 2 Corinthians, or sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter two. 1 Corinthians chapter two, I believe it's in like verse 10. I was looking at 2 Corinthians there for a second. I was like, where, where is it? 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 
but God, in verse 10, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of a man, which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Now we have received the spirit, or now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. So we know that wisdom comes from God. We know that knowledge and understanding comes from God. We know that we have been given the spirit of God. And in that, we know that the spirit testifies to us the, the, the things of God freely given to us by God. And, you know, on one hand, it's it's very easy to, to feel frustrated when you know something is true and you believe in your heart something, whatever it may be, you're pleading with said person and saying, don't you see it? It's all right here. When it, it, in reality, it's not our responsibility to, con- we, dare I say, it, you can't, I can't. It, it is impossible to convince somebody to believe anything. It's just, it, it, it's silly. It's, it, have you ever seen two people in a debate and you know, they're going back and forth and you've got each person set in their ways? It, never do you see in a debate somebody stop and say, huh, you're right. I'd never considered that before. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. The debate's over. I'm on your side now. That just doesn't happen, right? And it's because to such a large degree, we as humans are just so stuck in our ways and in what we believe and what we think is true. And once again, it's easy to, to take a look at somebody and anybody who you're talking to about any of the given things and say to yourself, how do you not see it? But I think the big question for us is what is it that that we're not seeing? Because Let's be real. We've got like, I don't know, however many people are in here. I'm not, not so great with numbers. Maybe like 63 people or so. 83, 100, I don't, I don't know. Um, and chances are we are not all completely aligned on all of the things, right? If we were to talk about specific doctrines, if we were to talk about I, anything, how, how you celebrate the Sabbath, what foods you should or shouldn't eat. To a pretty large degree, I'd say we're probably all pretty convinced in our own heart what we know to be true, right? Like, just think practically. Like, there's, there's no way that we are all completely aligned on everything. And chances are we even disagree on, on a handful of things, so who's right? God, thank you. <laughs> yeah, God is the one who writes the truth, right? He's the one who gets to say what is right or wrong. He's the one who gets to say what you should believe. And our response to that, well, what should our response be? Let's take a look. Amen. Yes and amen. I, I love it. Thank you, Andrew. Um, let's go to Hebrews uh, actually, no, Let, let's go to uh, um, Luke chapter 18 real quickly. I think this, this is a good place to start. Luke chapter 18. In verse 9, also he spoke this parable, Luke 18, 9. He spoke this parable to some who trusted themselves, that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed with himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers. And even as this tax collector, 
I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful. Be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So I think that's a good place to start. And at least in part, the, the petition here is just take a step back and consider it's really easy for us to, to be set in your ways and to, to know and believe what you believe to be true and to look at your brother, your friend, or your coworker. Maybe you go round and round and round and round over the same thing. It's, Why don't you see it? Why don't you see it? That completely missing the point. Seeing it, understanding knowledge comes from God. What is it that God is trying to show us? Screaming to us, whispering to us. Why don't you see it? Open your eyes. Humble yourself. Because I, I can guarantee you there are things probably that I, Pastor David, anybody and everybody here has in your heart that is set, that, that we already believe and set to be true to the point that even if we saw somebody, proverbially speaking, raised from the dead, that we may not be convinced. Instead, we may even be convinced of the opposite because we're so set in our ways. How important it is just to humble ourselves before God and recognize that he is the one who gets to define what truth is. So in Hebrews chapter four, Hebrews chapter four, and we're gonna go to verse 11. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. We won't, won't read it, but the, this uh, verse, actually verses or chapters three and four talk about the, the people of Israel actually having a very similar state and condition in their hearts. It says that they did not believe in spite of the works that, that God did over that, that 40 years to the point where they did not get to enter the true rest. And then it goes on to talk about how even they didn't get to enter the rest in Joshua. Um, it unpacks a, a, a psalm. David talks about today, if you hear my voice, today implying that you can enter the rest later. Where said, and anyway, the, the people of Israel had a very similar condition in their hearts where they were stuck in their ways. They did not believe, they disobeyed. Um, so, uh, 4.11, let us therefore be diligent to enter the rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him, who must give an account. So, and, and I think these are fairly popular uh, verses. We've all probably read them time and again, heard them quoted count, countless times, but the reason that we're going here is because God makes it very clear. We'll read verse 13 again. There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. See, at the end of the day, God is the one who knows all, who sees all. He's the one, once again, who gets to define what, what truth is, what, what we ought to believe as his children. And what is our responsibility to that? Is our responsibility then to learn a little bit of knowledge that, that we've learned to believe to be true, get and then basically use that to define us and then and anybody and everybody that we talk to, it's like, oh, I believe this, you should believe this. I believe this, you should believe this. Or should we humble ourselves before God and say, God, you know what? Thank you so much. 
that you have drawn me, that you have given me a relationship with you, I acknowledge fully, God, completely, that all understanding and wisdom comes from you, and any understanding and wisdom that I have is because you've given it to me. Thank you so much for, for giving me just this, this little sliver of understanding that I have. And I know that as much as I have, God, there is nothing compared to, or this is nothing compared to the infinite wisdom and knowledge and understanding that you have, God. By your grace, God, I pray that, that you give me as much or as little as you want and help me to be faithful, faithful with that. I acknowledge, God, that you are the one that gets to define the truth. Thank you. Humble yourself before God, right? That heart compared to the heart of the, the tax collectors, I am so great, I'm so mighty, and that, it's not an accusation. I'm saying just naturally, us in our, in our, uh, in our hearts, our human condition, we, we default to this prideful, puffed up knowledge, understanding place. And the effect that it has on us, it, I mean, truth be told, it can be devastating. I, I think uh, David actually does a really good job in, in Psalms. I, probably, I mean, a lot of Psalms, but I assume it's David. Actually, I guess I don't know it's David. Psalms 139? Any Bible buffs out here know whether or not David wrote Psalms 139? Oh, yes, it says the Psalm of David. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so David writes in Psalms 139. Oh Lord, you have searched me and know me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thoughts afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. There is not a word on my tongue, but behold, oh Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. For you formed me in my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, and I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet they, they were none of them. Do you see the heart that, that David demonstrates here? Just how, how beautiful is that? I, um, there, there's a, a, a certain practice that, that you can do. I, I've found it beneficial. I know many people have done it beneficial. Praying, praying the scripture in, in, in your time when you're, you're praying, land on a scripture and basically just pray it to God. Repeat the, the scripture to God. Pray it to God. Let, let the spirit testify the truth to you. Such a beautiful example of David basically saying, God, you're everything. You created me. You know me. You literally, like, it, there's a word on my, my tongue, and you know everything that is in my heart. You have searched me. And uh, we're, we're not going to read the entire chapter, but if you go to the very end, chap, uh, verse 23, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You see, this, this is the response that we ought to have 
right, to, to any, basically anything, anything God-related, any, anything that comes from, from the word. Because at the end of the day, anything apart from that. Now, sure, there, there is a time and a place, I think, to get to talk about, I don't know, a specific doctrine or a specific hey, I was reading this passage. What, like, I'm not putting that down by any means because it can be very edifying. I've been so edified from actually several people here that I, either we disagree on something or maybe we just are talking openly about something. It can be very edifying to talk about the word of God, talk about his, his things, his statutes, talk about his ways. But as important as it is to sharpen one another and to sharpen one another's countenance, I'd say it's even more important to always have that humble heart that, that David demonstrated. Have the humble, humble heart of the tax collector beating his chest. Have mercy on me. Because it is in that that God can work with him. See, God can't work with, I'm already set in my ways. I, I'm already believing on X, Y, or Z, A, B, or C. But what God can work with is, you know what, God? You know. You know my heart. You know my ways. You, you're the one who wrote the truth. So give me what you will, God, and help me to believe what, what I ought to believe. Today's message is an encouragement to take inventory of your own heart and what you believe. Don't, don't leave today and go through the week or... And this, this exercise is one, I think, that, that you can do fairly regularly. When, when you've got a little bit of quiet time or when, when you uh, are purposing your heart to, to read or pray or whatever, search me, God. Show me what I believe. You're the one who sees. You know me better than I know me. You see what's in my heart way more than I can see. I acknowledge that, God, and I'm asking you. Show me, and I can promise you, he will answer that prayer. Because it, it, it says very clearly, that if you pray a prayer accordingly to his will in the name of Jesus Christ, he will make it happen. Of course, this is in, in God's will. God, God would will that, <laughs> that, that you are aligned with his heart, right? That you see the things that, that he wants you to see that you understand the things that he wants you to understand. So do this and watch really the, the beautiful and incredible things that God will do with your life. Thank you for the time today. Pray God that, uh, I pray that you guys uh, have a really wonderful day. Um, stay hydrated. Um, my wife likes drinking water, so she's, she drinks like a bunch of water and I don't drink a lot. It's probably all the water I'm gonna drink today. Anyway, um, Love you guys. Thank you.